Okay. Um, I would like to first thank the organizers and the committee for this nice award. Um, I'll switch the gears to more medicine, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ozjan said. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a disease that probably directly or indirectly affected almost everyone in the audience, which is cancer. So cancer, this, this is a disease of uncontrolled proliferation of cells. And in a healthy person, normal cells live in harmony with other organs in the tissues. Um, they listen to the body. They listen to the signals of the body. The body tells them to stop dividing. They stop dividing. The body tells them to divide. They start dividing. So um, unfortunately, in contrast to normal cells, cancer cells do not listen to the body. And they divide and proliferate in an uncontrollable manner. And even so, they even go to other organs. They home there. They disrupt their normal functioning. And unfortunately, eventually lead to that in many uh, so, there are uh, several ways to treat cancer cells or tumors in human beings. And the, the standard way is the standard chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So, these therapies exploit the proliferative nature of cancer cells. So, as I told you, normal cells can also divide. For example, our intestine renews itself in just three or four days. So, clearly, these type of therapies have a lot of side effects. But recently, um, the medicine is really transforming. We have uh, so-called targeted therapies. These are much smarter. Uh, we are smarter now against cancer. Um, so these therapies are devised so that um, we target the differences in cancer cells that are not present in the normal cells. So obviously, for that reason, we have much less side effects using these drugs. But you can ask the question, do we cure cancer? Did we cure cancer? Obviously not. And this clearly suggests that we need new ammunition against cancer. And the best way to start is identifying these differences between cancer cells and normal cells. <coughs> and, you know, one is obviously the genetic alteration, so-called mutations in the genes. But recently, we and others um, uh, are interested in the metabolism of cancer cells. And it turns out that cancer cells actually have different metabolism compared to their normal tissue counterparts. Um, so we sequence basically all the human genome in the tumors coming from different subtypes, different patients. And it turns out that most of the mutations are in the genes that control uptake of one single nutrient. And that is glucose, sugars, basically. So this is, in fact, the most commonly used clinical uh, test to diagnose cancer patients. And uh, it's called PET scan. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure many of you have heard of it if you watch the news. It's on the news almost every day. Um, in, so what do we do in PET scan? Um, basically, for PET scan, you use a molecule that's very similar to glucose. The only difference is the molecule we use, or clinicians use, so-called FTG, is uh, um, a glucose-like molecule that emits positrons. So it helps us to figure out which organs take up the most amount of glucose um, in a patient. So the procedure is you basically inject it in the vein of the patients. You wait about 15 minutes, and the organs that use up the most glucose, such as heart and brain, start to light up. But you see some other things here, and these are tumors. This is a lymphoma patient. <coughs> it ha he has, in this case, um, some lymphoma nodules in the abdomen. And this is actually quite a useful instrument to stage tumors, to diagnose patients, and to follow the therapy, if it's effective or not. So, but one other message you can get from this, tumors like glucose. They love it. So, um, unfortunately, if you like something a lot, for example, your food, you run out of it as quickly as possible, right? So if you look at the tumors, you see the same thing. A lot of the tumors are incredibly poor in terms of their nutrients. So uh, glucose, as I, as I told you, is very highly consumed. So it's also low in the tumor microenvironment. And here, it's a section of a tumor. You see a blood vessel, and in this section, there is quite a low amount of glucose. So as scientists, we like to simplify things. Um, we like to study in the lab environment. We like to do stuff to the cells uh, to see how they react, how their metabolism are. And for that, we use these petri dishes. We basically culture cells in these media. It's their food, basically. And we use a, a lot of food. Uh, there's a lot of glucose in these culture that we use because we want to keep them healthy. We want to grow them. But unfortunately, it turns out we're not doing the right thing. Because clearly, as I told you, 
cancer cells are living in this very sugar poor environment. So in order to study that, you really need to find out or figure out culture models that mimic the tumor microenvironment much better than petri dish. It's stopped working. Oh, okay. So for that, we set up a system which I called Nutristat. I was actually originally inspired by Nutribars, to be honest. Uh, this helps <laughs> us to keep the nutrient levels low, not over a short period of time, but rather a long period of time, which helps us to mimic the tumor microenvironment much better. We actually published this very recently. Um, when we use these methods, it turns out cancer cells like to use their organelle, the powerhouse organelle. I'm sure many of you heard of it from high school, biology classes, mitochondria. So here are the picture of the mitochondria. They're like little round spheres, basically, in the cells. And they're very important for production of energy. Um, so it turns out under these nutrient low conditions, cancer cells are very highly dependent on their powerhouse. And furthermore, we realized that when you look at the primary tumors coming from patients, about 10% of all, all tumors have mitochondrial defects. And this is usually presents itself as a mutation in their mitochondrial DNA, which is not that important. They just have a dysfunction in their power organelle. So but this gives us the opportunity, maybe these 10% of the tumors, which, are, which have uh, this low level of mitochondrial activity, but also very highly dependent on this mitochondrial activity, could be very sensitive to mitochondrial toxins. So you basically need drugs that targets mitochondria in order to treat these cells. That was our hypothesis. So long story short, we looked at several drugs. And there's actually a very well-known clinical drug that turns out to be a mitochondrial toxin. And it's called a metformin. This is one of the most highly prescribed drugs in the United States, as well as in Turkey or in other parts of Europe. Um, my mom uses it. I'm sure a lot of people uh, in the audience are using it. They have to. It's the most highly prescribed drug, I think, in the United States. Um, and it has anti-mitochondrial activities. So the hypothesis is that then, can we use this drug that, to treat that 10% of the patients which carry mitochondrial DNA mutations or mitochondrial dysfunction in their tumors? I'm not sure I'm going to show you a lot of the data, but so here's what we found. These are just two examples of the uh, tumors that we found to carry these type of mutations, so-called mitochondrial dysfunction. And they are indeed very sensitive when you treat the mouse with this drug. So you see the uh, uh, decrease in terms of the tumor growth in this mouse model, suggesting that 10% of the patients that carry these mitochondrial defects in their tumors are really very sensitive to these drugs. And in fact, this is going to help the clinicians to direct clinical trials in the future, because these are already FDA-approved drugs. So you can basically use the diabetes drug that was already approved, used by many of the people, as a cancer therapy for this small percent of the people which, who carry these type of mutations. So in terms of the big theme, theme, my big theme, I'm very interested in what is going on in the tumor environment of uh, the patients. So you can imagine glucose is low in the tumor microenvironment, but there are other nutrients that are low too. So you can imagine if you figure out which nutrients are low and which cancer cells are dependent on these low nutrients, you can identify therapies, even diets that restrict these nutrients and in a way help the um, therapy. I'm not saying chemotherapy will be basically gone. It will just be uh, a supportive uh, regimen uh, in addition to these therapies. And my lab hopefully is going to work um, on these type of strategies. So with that, I want to end my talk. And again, thanks to organizers.